So hello everybody, thank you for joining uh, me again. Uh, we're on season four, episode 14 now of a conversation with Comitan. I'm here with a returning guest, someone who I have spoken to a couple of times now. Uh, it's Professor Michael York. Uh, we have um, spoken for the last couple of years really on various different sort of uh, topics, primarily centering on sort of astronomy, religion, pagan identity. We're going to continue with that kind of conversation today um, and hopefully, I don't know, come to some, some sort of resolutions or uh, or perhaps just continue the, the, uh, the discussion on. So hello, Michael. Thanks for joining me um, and I hope you're well. <clears throat> I'm well. I hope you are too. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the last time we spoke uh, in sort of <laughs> um, over Zoom, uh, we've had, been having email conversations, but but over Zoom, the last time we spoke, um, we sort of covered quite a few things. Uh, but one of the one of the topics that, that I've sort of been thinking about since we spoke is 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 centered around this idea of salvation, but particularly sort of the difference between pagan salvation and um, sort of my understanding of, of salvation from a sort of astronist point of view. Um, and we spoke about this sort of cyclical form of salvation from the pagan perspective, and then my sort of linear form of salvation. So I just wanted to kind of go into this a little bit deeper because it's something we've not managed to sort of speak about since since then so um i suppose let's start off with if you give us a sort of uh brief outline of the sort of pagan worldview you know that that sort of cyclical ideas of of what salvation is if you will okay first of all first of all you have to recognize as with the Abrahamic religions, there's many different forms of paganism, many different uh, formulations and beliefs and so forth. So, uh, and salvation is not a term that's frequently used within a pagan context. Um, your linear salvation, as, as I understand it, uh, from a pagan perspective is, is more Abrahamic. Mm. It had, you go through a, a, a sequence and you uh, arrive at a, a certain goal or end. Some of that exists in paganism. Um, there's the idea of the, the Blessed Isles, the, the um, um, I forget all the different terms. A lot of contemporary pagans use the term summer land. Yes. And so in a way, there is a kind of an afterlife whether that's salvational uh it's usually considered a a positive not a negative so um pagans don't entertain the concept of a hell or a hades or or a punishment right um, although that does exist in classical uh, greek paganism you have hades yes um my own understanding is that uh there is an afterlife, but because paganism is so structured, modeled, or inspired by the, the cycles of nature, yes. of going from spring, summer, autumn, winter, and then re, kind of a rebirth in spring, there's the notion of rebirth, which is, seems to be very strong in paganism. Not all paganisms, but, but it, for most contemporary Western paganism, I would say, they're more into the idea of coming back because life for the pagan is not something to escape. It's not something um, to reach some kind of Gnostic other world or paradise or heaven. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, there are pains in life. There's Weltschmerz, but Schmerz, but there's joie de vivre. And that's the part that the pagan celebrates. And because of that, the pagan essentially wants to come back to the earth. So this rebirth thing is considered kind of a desire 
that's integral to uh, at least some people. Yeah. And, uh, that that's so interesting isn't it this idea of in a way um like you say you know that the pagans in a general sense we're, we're sort of maybe generalizing here but you know pagans mm. in a general sense aren't kind of searching for this salvation in a sense like from uh in contrast to you know christianity for example um that sees the world it sees obviously the world as very corrupt, doesn't it? As something that needs that that really, in a way, shouldn't exist. Uh, we should be with God. We are removed from God in the Christian worldview, aren't we? Yeah. Um, being mm-hmm. in this sort of very um, well, uh, this suffering, all the suffering that takes place in the world. So, how do pagans respond to that sort of? You know, I know you can only speak from a sort of a general point of view, but how do pagans respond to that sort of Christian um, view that the world is suffering, that 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 this is why, because of sin, basically, isn't it? Um, are do pagans believe in sin? Do they believe in in that the world is perhaps corrupt or is? Um, I think they would probably more put it in terms of not the world being corrupt, but humanity being corrupt. Uh, We are earthlings, so we're very much, in a sense, we're the personification of the earth. Yes. Uh, But, and the corruption that you're referring to from a pagan perspective is usually seen more ecologically. Um, The the earth is, is our mother. The earth is is God. Right. Uh, the earth is divine, sacred, holy. And we have desecrated that as uh, as we've lived on this planet. And yet, and if we destroy our planet, we feel that we're going to be basically destroying ourselves. Maybe, as in your perspective, some of us will survive elsewhere in other planets and so forth. But paganism I think basically is entertaining the or focus on the concept of the whole of humanity, not not focusing on just the privileged few. Right. And so because of that, its efforts towards salvation, its salvation is health, it's the health of the planet and the health of humanity being relating to our planet and protecting our planet and letting our planet flourish so that we can flourish with it. But we're not the only forms of life. So uh, we, from from a pagan perspective, we are, we see life itself as something sacred and to be protected. And that's not just humanity, that's the animals, that's the plants, all forms of life. Yeah. And that gets controversial because, of course, there are negative forms too. There are uh, maybe viruses aren't really alive, but there is bacteria, there are amoebas, and various diseases, which uh, we, I think, the pagan tends to feel that these become operative when things are out of balance. Yes. And so salvation, for a pagan perspective, is restoring the natural balance of things yes yeah that that's really interesting i think there are similarities i I see some similarities between so the pagan sort of view and and my own but i think i'm talking specifically now from my astronist perspective um Mm -hmm. a lot of astronism is about escaping this world it's about which which you could say shares some aspects of christianity but in a slightly different way that the astronaut wishes to literally escape. So that, that, that kind of physical escape uh, rather than just purely a spiritual uh, sort of escape in the afterlife, if you will, um, which is why I came to describe sort of the astronaut view of salvation as being linear, as being this very much um, this sort of straight line going up, to the stars essentially um you know that 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 is the place where we need to escape from this kind of limitation really all this sort of again this sort of suffering 
um this sort of evil in the world um i think astronism does share some similarities with christianity in that sense that it's it makes this observation about the world that the world is that it sees suffering that it sees evil that it that there is all these terrible things um but in a way from what you've described and from my other readings of pagan the pagan view um it, it's not as negative in a way is it the, the the pagan view that um the world is corrupt or that the world is um full of evil and suffering in a sense it doesn't seem it seems more positive would that be fair to say do you think oh i think we've can we hear true no yeah what's happened because it's i've lost you and i just haven't <laughs> Sorry, I haven't just back. back. <laughs> can you hear me? Can, is, it, is it something? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Yes, yes. All right, I, I'm not seeing you now, but I, I can. You can still you. hear me. <laughs> I can still hear you. All right. Um, I want to clarify one thing in that there are Gnostic forms of paganism. I mean, if you look at uh, Platonism, Neoplatonism, uh, even the Kabbalah and so forth, um, they do have that same, maybe not in the sense, in your physical linear sense that Astonism uh, yeah. endorses, but in a, at least in a escaping the corruptions and the degradations of the earth. And it's it's considered from a Gnostic perspective, uh, physical incarnation is the lowest uh, form of being mm. uh, the, and the furthest fall from this thing that they refer to as the one. Yes. And so that does exist. And there are, are uh, Gnostic pagans uh, and even traditionally, not just contemporarily, look at some of the pagan peoples in the, uh, in Iraq and so forth, and and their position is more Gnostic than it is this kind of uh, uh, more materialistic form of paganism. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to use the word to learn. Uh, All right. Yeah. Or the I, th I don't know if we mentioned that before or not, but um, the again, if you. I mean, pagans are focused on nature, and they see nature as a positive. And it does include Feldschmerz, but it does have the positive as well. And it's cyclical. So if you have pain, then you you move from pain into pleasure. Maybe then you regress to pain. But without some experience and knowledge of pain, then we really would not know pleasure. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, you really can't need, need both. And so, again, it's... The negativity is, I think, more human irresponsibility and mismanagement. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's overpopulation, or that certainly is a factor. But it's the you know the fossil fuels uh, being out of control and the climate changes and and then the consequences of that. So, and it can't be just us. Uh, because if we look at Turkey and Syria, there are natural events that really don't have much to do with humanity. Maybe they could have constructed better uh, buildings. Uh, but the earthquake is something that's really basically beyond human control, at least at this point. Yes. And yeah. so there are natural catastrophes that one has to live with and endure yes yeah um i mean you mentioned before about uh the earth in paganism being sort of sacred uh divine in a sense um would it then therefore be fair to say that paganism is kind of geocentric in that sense uh i'm just thinking from sort of my perspective being more cosmocentric and i think we have spoken about this perhaps before this obviously i'm focused on um 
everything that's beyond Earth, but the pagans seem to focus more on Earth itself. And I think I, I would say, yeah, I would say absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's it's highly geocentric. Yeah, and for for the most part. I mean, again, there are these more Gnostic exceptions, and some pagans call themselves panentheists, and so they still see Earth and earthly existence. Uh, within some transcendent uh, sacrality of nature. Uh, that's Eric Corrington's uh, work, and, and it's one of the statements he makes that uh, from the nature, I think he calls it nature's, nature's religion or nature religion. Yes. But the basic principle is that there is nothing that's outside of nature, that all is nature, including your your uh, yeah. stars and everything, that external Abrahamic entity that has created this beyond itself or outside of itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose as well from... I don't know, just just looking in specifically at this word uh, neo-pagan as well. I've, I've had an interest in that, um, particularly from the perspective that um, I don't know when this began, but you'll, I'm sure, be able to tell me. Um, neo-paganism seems to have painted this sort of picture that it has this long lineage, which I'm sure is correct, but also... Um, do you not see that as a form of or a tactic for leg- legitimizing sort of these new religious movements, these contemporary movements like Wicca, where they say, well, yes, we are a new religion, but we also have very ancient origins. Do you see that as a kind of a tactic or a method to kind of legitimize themselves in a way that they aren't yeah. just created today or by one person it, it has been a tactic yeah um, the uh-huh. consensus now seems to be shifting away with the recognition that the margaret murray thesis that uh, in the middle ages and so forth in the, the which uh witch days or witch trials um that's being increasingly rejected that there's uh, and i think ronald hutton has done a lot of work on, in, on this score and he distinguishes i think correctly between pagan survivals and surviving paganism yes and there are pagan survivals but they're not quite the same as an, an actual religion that's still been functioning all, all along um so i think that tactic of legitimation is not as strong as it used to be mm, um but at the same token there has been this kind of earth oriented spirituality which we can see in the past and we can see in with the group roman yeah and so, in Polynesia and, and Africa and so forth. Um, and contemporary paganism tends to die affinity with the Gnostic. And so there may not be a continuous tradition, but there is a recoverable tradition. And that's kind of where the I think the emphasis is, is going in these days. Yes, yeah. And I suppose that also relates as well to um what we what we've been sort of talking about over emails and writing about is this idea of there existing the pagan traditions so to stand alongside the abrahamic the dharmic you know the eastern religion yeah. as well um so i suppose how does that relate to d- does that feed into or continue you know to use this legitimization uh, process do you think is that 
it's necessary, it seems, doesn't it, that, that there has to be this lineage, in a way, of this pagan sort of identity. I don't know if there has to be a, a lineage as such, but it's, um, there's an aesthetic right. underlying this. And, I mean, many pagans believe that the gods literally, but others can accept the gods as uh, as metaphors right. and aesthetic traditions. And so I think a lot of contemporary paganism is involved with re-examining these old traditions, especially in mythology, what is recoverable of the cultic practices, the worship practices. Um, but there, but again, there's a, there's a freedom involved. There's there's nobody within paganism that can say this is what we do, and this is wrong. It's it's up to the individual, and uh, so it's an individual choice matter. Other people come together because they share particular outlooks or practices. Um, they even come together when they don't because there's still is a uh, uh, an overall gregariousness, which I think is part of religion in, in general, that people like to gather together. And if there's some area in which they can overlap in their beliefs and practices, all the more, all the better. But yes. Yeah, I suppose as well. Um, we, we again, we spoke about that in the article that we wrote was that um, we disagreed slightly on the idea of the astronic tradition being a sort of separate thing from paganism. And I thought that was quite interesting for us to explore here um, because I'd sort of created the, uh, or I'd referred to the Abrahamic, the Dharmic and the Tawic traditions. And then mm -hmm. we we sort of had some mix up, I think, over what the Taoic tradition is as well. So looking at sort of the Chinese religions and um, I, I think there is a lot of work still to be done there in terms of distinguishing um, whether pagan, whether paganism or the pagan tradition is a distinct tradition or whether it's more of a strand or a kind of uh, undercurrent or theme or pattern of different of of different traditions, if you know what I mean. Uh, theme or pattern gets closer to it, I think. Yeah, uh, I mean the whole concept. I mean, where we where we were basically different. You seem to be more into a classification thing, and I think it's a danger when it becomes geographically based, yeah. because, uh, and within the, the approach that I take, it's more. A sociological concept of the ideal type there yeah. is no you, you designate the ideals uh there's no one religion which is any which is purely the ideal the ideal is an ideal but and so the sociologist uses uses it as a measuring device rather than really as a classification system but and so and every religion has elements of all or at least of one other ideal type, maybe all four of them. Uh, they're a blend to some extent. And so within paganism, you see that there are Abrahamic Gnostic uh, constructs or beliefs. Um, there certainly are secular uh, concepts where m many pagans don't believe in gods and goddesses at all. Um, and they see the earth is sacred and, and, and that's really basically it. Um, and then, then you have your whole Dharmic approach, and, and Dharmic is kind of Gnostic again, because ultimately they want to escape from this planet, from the, the tiresome sequence of rebirths, where, which the rebirths are exactly what the pagan would tend to celebrate rather than desire to escape from. So you have those kind of uh, differences between these ideal types of religion, but again, you will find a blend within any particular religion of other of elements from more than just one ideal. Yeah. I don't know if that... Well, but also as well, even with the Dharmic and the pagan sort of divergence there, but yeah. at least the, the Dharmic 
religions in a sense do recognize that there is rebirth in a sense so they are kind of closer to paganism than sort of the abrahamic religions aren't very, they? very very much so very much so i mean there's closeness also between abrahamic and and uh and paganism if you look at the roman catholic church or the uh, eastern orthodox uh, um they have saints rather than deities but there's there's a whole panoply of of kind of divine or semi-divine beings um so paganism is not all that different from abraham religion either but there is traditionally uh a lot many more pagans probably endorse buddhism over hinduism but there still is a strong affinity between hinduism and, and contemporary paganism and uh, i used to write articles for one of these Hindu magazines where they had recognized uh, the fact that there were these similarities existed between the two different faiths in a, in a broad sense. So um, there's not the same rejection that you get with the Abrahamic religions of gods and goddesses being really devils and demons. And um, there's only one God, period. Uh, and Hinduism doesn't quite go that far. I mean, it has some elements like that, and there are theistic forms of Hinduism, which can be can seem very similar to uh, Christianity or other forms of Abrahamic spirituality. So again, it's really much more of a mishmash. The the ideal type thing is is, is a device that the sociologist can employ in trying to understand religions and understand why is this particular faith does it where does it fall short from the ideal it gives us a, a focus on which to uh, try to uh, find answers to and so it's more uh, a device of utility than it is saying all right this is this and this is that um, because of course in the real world nothing is ever so uh definite is it? so you know but scholars do like unfortunately at, at times it would be nice if it could be but <laughs> that's not the real world so like you said you know um you just referred to sort of you know certain catholic or eastern orthodox traditions as as possibly representing uh, a pagan uh, but obviously they wouldn't see it that way, would they? They've no, been, no, of course, rarely, rarely. Yeah, they, they've been sort of contrasting themselves with, or certainly distancing themselves from that kind of pagan identity, and even using that word as a kind of pejorative, haven't they? Uh, Absolutely, for, for many hundreds of years. <laughs> but if you go to these these churches and you see the the, the hands on physical. Yes. Touching of, of an icon or, or an image of a saint or um, it's there's that physicality. I mean, there's a whole new emerging field within sociology that's basically focused on material religion. Right. And it's looking at the material aspects of of all religions and that that kind of physicality that that need or desire to touch yes to have contact with the sacred to have your your relics from from a saint all this it's really very similar to pagan physicality to to lyric uh idea of touching and uh, experiencing the sacred through the senses have you seen a um well part of neo-paganism has been to kind of reclaim this word pagan hasn't it that that's part of the to, tr to try and get rid of some of the, the the negative connotations around that that have been attached to that word possibly from various different christian churches throughout the centuries so do you think that that's been successful do you think at this stage uh this sort of reclaiming of that word or do you think it's still quite widespread you know the kind of use highly of con highly controversial it's highly controversial um yeah. i've used the term pagan and, and a lot of the criticism i get is 
the fact that I use it broadly and I recognize other peoples as being within that ideal, yeah. being that the ideal type being applicable to them. Um, but a lot of the criticism I get is that pagan is a Western term and we're using that for non-Western peoples. Right. Um, there hasn't been a better term unless the term telluric ultimately becomes yeah. uh, more widely accepted and used, but that's that's yet to yeah. be the case. And, but do you think that it's important to still use that word pagan then in sense of you know, when you're referring to a sort of pagan identity, I suppose, do you think it's still, it has a use in a sense? It it does have a, it does have a meaning, even though so many things have been attached to it, it does have a sort of utility. It, sense. it has utility. That's, that would be the word that I would want to use for it. Um, often we can call it earth religion, but then again, you have two terms there. It's that you don't have, you know, you have Dharmic, secular, and Abrahamic, but then you have earth religions. So some people have used the term earthism or something on that score. That's why I think the word telluric yeah. works in, in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I've lost the other thought. I was going to come in on that, so it'll it'll come back. No, <laughs> Hopefully. I, I like the telluric because it, it sort of it also from my perspective distinguishes um sort of those geocentric religions like we talked about earlier from the sort of space religions you know uh the sort of cosmocentric as i was called them religions um so i i do kind of appreciate that word in a sense and i think in a way it's probably more helpful to refer to um these traditions that we're talking about um which then makes me come back to the term pagan to kind of reassess it in a sense if we're going to move forward with this use of the term telluric um then it sort of makes me reflect on well is is pagan more of a like I, like we said before is it more of a theme or pattern within various different uh religions rather than being a an actual tradition itself or or an identity itself you know if we're looking at pagan themes and patterns in the abrahamic religions for example or the dharmic religions um that suggests that in a way the pagan uh word or pagan identity is it can be found throughout all the different traditions or if we're talking about material religion, I think yeah. the term pagan is convenient. Okay. Uh, being able to say that. Now, there's another aspect. Now I remembered what I had already <laughs> forgotten. Is if you look at the origins of the term pagan, um, I, it's I think it's incorrect when people claim that it came from the countryside and it meant country bumpkin. It was yeah. a blast areas that were converted to the new faith. Um, it's actually a Roman term, and a Paganus is a person of the immediate locality. Mm. And and I think that's the real origin, and that's also something that's at heart, and this might contrast with Ashtonism to, to some extent then. Pagans are very much involved with the immediate environment with with their locality with their surroundings they know where the sun rises where the moon rises and sets um how the stars relate to that area at different times of the year um they're very much, very much aware of the weather the seasons uh and it all is focused on that immediate environment now of course with everything being jeopardized as it is today, there's a much wider focus on, on the whole earth and the planet itself because the imbalance overall affects also the locality. But that immediate here and now locality is vital to the physicality, materiality, spirituality of a pagan outlook. Yeah, and, and that's actually 
that contrasts quite well with astronism in a sense. And it kind of gets down mm. to the, the main contrast, which is an astronist um, would 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 not relate that to the locality. So it would um, it wouldn't look at how the sun, the stars relate to the locality, but how we relate to the the sort mm. of universe in a sense. So I think that's a really good way of contrasting that kind of pagan view with the maybe astronist view on that. Yeah, I could I could accept that. Yes. Yes. Um yes, we've we've just spoken about this idea of that difference. And I think that gets down to the core uh difference between sort of astronism from um sort of that pagan view. Um again, you know, an astronist would look at the broader universe in a sense, uh, rather than that locality, as as we were just saying. Um, and in a way, um the astronist would wants to explore that that larger universe in a way. It, it the, the astronist wants to uh, kind of leave home in a sense earth is home and there is that recognition that her the earth is our home um and that it always will be but then we want to go out and explore in a sense i think also another another distinction is that and correct me if i'm wrong here is that the pagan sees the answers to possibly life's questions here on earth possibly in the locality as we were just saying whereas the astronist views the answers to life to meaning to um i don't know like we were saying before salvation perhaps as as being far away as being very at the other at the other end of the universe perhaps as as being not immediately tangible if, if you know what I mean, um, that, that we have to go on this journey, this sort of physical and possibly metaphysical journey to reach those answers. Is, is that a, a sort of fair comparison, would you say, or was the pagan? Uh, not really I'm pagan? not sure, because I think pagans are travelers. Right. And pagans like to travel, and they and traditionally they, they travel. They move from one area to another. And the what the locality concept for the pagan is that's where you are and you respect that and you and you try to perfect that but that doesn't mean that you're locked into that mm. and pagans i think are just as curious with the cosmos and overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the cosmos um they still don't want to use the cosmos as an escape because they feel that there's responsibilities with the here and now and the locality but i i think the the mysteries of the cosmos and the enormity of the cosmos vis-a-vis -vis our tiny little speck of infinitesimal infinitesimal speck uh within this overwhelming thing that i mean that's that's the greatest mystery that there is whether we can ever comprehend it, I I don't know, but I think we endeavor to. And I think science is certainly trying to understand how the how the cosmos came into being. Um, uh, it's I mean it's it, it's exploring this, and this is there's no real divide between contemporary paganism at least and science. Mm. Science very much a part of uh the here and the now and what we have to operate with and there's a respect to it there's also a great love for the arts and yeah. not to uh leave the one for the other there's there's a balance i my favorite on this score is is north of fry who's a canadian uh, critic literary critic and he said that we the human being wants to be detached to observe the reality as as objectively and disinterestedly as possible, but the human being also wants to be passionately involved with with what there is to be passionately involved. He says you can't do both at the same time. So what he's basically saying is that we have to learn a kind of 
you can even call it a cosmic dance, but a kind of dance between those two positions. We need both. We can't have one without the other, ultimately. We just have to take, they have to take their turns. Yes. Yeah, that's really curious. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that actually makes me, I don't know, I was, as you were just speaking then, I was thinking about this idea of the kind of, the status of human beings or the, the yeah, the, I think, yeah, the, the status of human beings in paganism in the sense, and just contrasting with perhaps the Christian view um, or even the Judaic, the Judaic view, the Jewish view, um, from from the Christian Judaic view, it, it, it there's this idea that humans are special in a way that we are made in the image of God, for example, um, and there is a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar idea in astronism in a way. Um, is there a, a what what position do human beings hold in pagan sort of traditions generally? Right. Uh, that yeah. that position is not absent in religion. Uh, it's basically a kind of a form of spiritual humanism. Right. That's that it's recognizing our uniqueness, mm. uh, our, how we have to formulate our values from our perspective, uh, coordinating with the with the earth and with our environment and surroundings, but. Uh, the term humanism is all because of its uh, historic association with rationalism. It's often rejected within pagan circles. They don't like that because pagans now are trying to re-emphasize that we're not the only life form, and that others are are also valuable. Uh, maybe not, although they won't say this. Maybe not as valuable as we are for ourselves, but um, mm -hmm. I think there is a. If you look at classical paganism, the Greco-Roman thing, the human was uh, central and very important, and uh, and the emphasis was basically placed on the human, but not divorced from nature, um, mm -hmm. which is what seems to happen in our secular Abrahamic uh, predominance of today. Do you think that we've become very much more anthropocentric um, as a result of that? And is and does that actually come from Christianity in a way? Um, I mean, you may not associate immediately sort of anthropocentrism with Christianity. You may associate it more with being theocentric. Uh, but do you think that there are sort of anthropocentric I don't know, strands, you know, if you think that, that, that God became man, you know. Yes, yes. I mean, that's, when you look at Genesis, I mean, the whole idea of Genesis is the is the creation of, of Adam yeah. and of, of humanity. Uh, and that's kind of like the culmination. And uh, and then we sinned. We, yeah. we didn't well, do it. This isn't there on, on the human, uh, whereas it seems in pagan um, traditions in pagan writings it's more about well yes humans are um, we are unique in a sense uh, we are distinguished maybe from other creatures but essentially we do exist and depend upon this natural uh, order that we exist within that we aren't kind of separate from that you know we're not yeah, above I not superior to it in a way right right we do have a certain responsibility because we have the potential of actually destroying yeah. the homeland uh which uh, i don't think exists with other species i don't i don't think they've ever been in a position where they can actually destroy the planet but we we could now yeah and and so that puts us in a, in a highly uh different position um that's interesting yeah yeah i was going to ask actually about sort of and i mentioned it in the email to you about pagan eschatology um sort of the end times the the sort of uh, apocalyptic ideas and just from when you've been speaking just there it, it kind of comes out again um and it's also in related into contemporary 
events taking place in the world, it seems. Um, do you think that, especially regarding climate change, of course, um, do you think that sort of the neo-pagan paganism has become quite dependent on these narratives in a sense that, that they are kind of fueling these narratives of, you know, we're coming to the end of the world if we don't change our ways kind of thing, which is. Uh, yeah. It, which is a form of an apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that the rebirth of paganism in, in our day and age, it's, it's what we do when, as our parents get older and we suddenly realize they're not going to be there yeah. forever. And we start appreciating them and trying to, and caring for them in ways that we didn't when we were young yeah. and i think that's the same recognition is that we see that the earth is be becoming more fragile and or at least nature as on on earth and so i think the whole pagan sentiment comes out of kind of that kind of a recognition of mm -hmm. the vulnerability that uh, of the parent mother earth and um whether we have to escape the earth because we're going to, she's going to die or whether we can try to uh, restore her in some way. That's, that's ultimately the, the question, but you know, the apocalypse, it's not a Christian concept of the end of the world and with revelations and all that, but it is an, an imminent threat. It's the world clock on the its last what five seconds. Uh, so that's that is the uh, the eschatology. The, they don't tend to use that term, and they don't tend to put it in in those terms of apocalypse and revelation and so forth. But it it's very much there. Yeah, and and do you think that's emerged? particularly with neo-paganism. I presume that that wasn't in sort of classical paganism, those kinds of ideas. It's, it's that's, more... that's true. That would be true. Uh, I think the term neo-paganism is kind of going out of fashion. It was it was important when it first developed and, and was used, and it was probably ultimately used more academically than it was among pagans themselves. Yes. But uh, although various pagans did, were the ones that first came up with the term, and it was distinguishing uh, a kind of uh, Tulur spirituality that's relevant today, that isn't that is different from the concerns and efforts of the past. Uh, it may have affinities with them and, and some some kind of lineage connections with them, but it's very much concerned with today. And that's why it's a new paganism. But yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, um, I was I was going to ask you, do you think that's possibly one of the challenges, perhaps, of paganism in the contemporary? Because it seems that um, we, we could we kind of spend a lot of time distinguishing between terms in a way and there's sort of a lot of controversy over the use of certain terms and we're always kind of defining those and trying to distinguish and do you think that's one of the challenges i mean do you spend a lot of your time trying to kind of you know um i, I don't know explain these terms or I, that that's a challenge for, for all of humanity that's not just for yeah, pagans. Well, we're, I mean, we're always conversing and we always and we use words that's how we do converse but they have to be always explained re-explained redefined rejected when they're no longer appropriate re, uh, new ones just created to cover new ideas which are always happening so yeah i think that i mean that's very much a part of paganism but it's it's not only paganism it's i think you'll find that in every tradition yeah i i don't know i just i just i i, I felt that there is a more of an emphasis on that in in sort of the pagan uh, community just because there are so many terms that are used and there is of course a lot of historical um, uh, connotations you know I'm thinking of words now like heathen or um, I don't know you'll probably think of other ones but I've just had heathen on my mind then um, we the, does that not relate to I don't know 
a kind of identity crisis that's still going on that that pagans oh, well, kind of yes, like, but, is that, but is that is that unique to paganism look at christianity and and the terms i mean their theological terms uh probably far exceed yeah that of of contemporary paganism at least and and they're always trying to define and they're always it's the most miserable uh form of religion i think i mean it's it's worse than islam it's worse than uh, judaism in the fact that you look at the different forms of christianity uh, and it's constantly constantly going in that yeah. direction yeah and paganism is not that that much different but i think i think christianity is ahead of it yes in, in that sense but but I think that's that's also again human nature is that that we are constantly refining our ideas, um, coming up with new uh, approaches that we feel are viable. Yes. Yeah. And and trying to reject the things that are no longer applicable and usable. Mm. And uh, I think that's that's humanity in some sense. Yes. Do, do you think that just going back slightly to the the, the term eschatology again um mm -hmm. do you think that that word hasn't been used as much in the sort of pagan tradition um since it's sort of emerged um in the contemporary i mean um because in a way it doesn't kind of fit in with the pagan world view in, in a sense does it because eschatology and end times and those kind of ideas are more linear in a sense in a way that we're kind of yeah. leading up to something and that and that again just just kind of rounds off goes back to the beginning of our conversation about this linearity this linear path this salvation this linear salvation um i, I don't know it, it what i'm trying to say is i suppose does does it having a definitive apocalypse i don't know maybe undermined the pagan worldview in a in a way that's supposed to be cyclical it's it's supposed to be never ending is it is that if if i'm correct in that um but then you've got this eschatology that's emerging however informally uh that talks about I don't know apocalypse or that the world may end um because of human actions um I don't know I just wondered what you what you thought about whether those two right. things work whether those whether that kind of apocalyptic view works with the cyclical with the cyclical yeah um... I'm not sure if it does. Yes or no. I mean, my understanding of eschatology has as much to do with what's going to happen after we die. Yeah. Uh, so the afterlife, and and the pagans feel that there's that it goes both ways. You go to the other, but then you come back. If there is an apocalypse and we destroyed the planet or destroyed all life mm. on the. Um, I think ultimately the pagan will feel that it will re redevelop. I mean, it may take millions and millions of years as it did already, but that it will redevelop and how that affects us individually or consciously. I mean, that's out. Of, I don't know. The yeah. other thing I wanted to just mention though, in the whole idea of, an afterlife and more of an ast astronomic oh, yes. idea that that um, distinguished people, heroes and and artists, perhaps uh, became uh, became an, a stellar entity yeah. and were placed in the heavens, and uh, so there was this high idea of. And I don't know once you become a stellar constellation, whether the idea of rebirth is still applicable. That I don't know. But they did have this projection into the heavens. And it, was, it wasn't everybody. It was, you know, distinguished individuals yes. that achieved that. 
yes. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So how how that plays out astronomically or as you know in in your yeah. spirituality, I, I don't know, but yeah, yeah, I've looked at that, and and certainly that's kind of like a an astral or stellar eschatology, I suppose, isn't it? And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I have looked at that, and I and I find it interesting. Um, I would say that that again, it comes down to this sort of journey that I'm on to try to distinguish anything that is astronomical. Um, what I would say is maybe astronomically religious <laughs> um, okay. or, or beliefs regarding the mm. stars, distinguishing all of that from uh, the paganism, but also the, the other religions as well. Um, whether, whether I will be successful in actually achieving that, I don't know, but the, that's why I, I sort of appreciated earlier about this idea of the telluric concept because mm -hmm. I think it does distinguish pagan from astronist, for example. Yeah. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly, you know that they. I, I've done a lot of work on on th that kind of lineage again, and and that's why I mentioned earlier uh, regarding uh, the sort of. Again, I'm going to use the word neo-pagan, this sort of neo-pagan um, attempt to create this narrative in a way, going back into history of the history of pagan, the pagan identity. I've done the same, essentially, uh, in my dissertation. I, I traced it all the way back to even prehistoric times mm. uh, in the sort of rock art and, and things like that that, 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 were, that were done. So... I understand that kind of sort of journey to legitimize that the kind of um, that journey to try and tell a narrative, a, a lineage in a sense. Uh, and I would just see that belief that you mentioned as just part one part of that in a well, way. The, um, yeah. And certainly uh, that also plays in specifically to astronist belief as well. Um astronism sees itself as the kind of culmination of all these earlier forms mm -hmm. so you look at things like russian cosmism for example which was which emerged in the sort of 1800s uh, among certain russian philosophers um and that had many sort of um you know astronomical ideas and beliefs uh, it's a very interesting movement called Russian Cosmism, uh, mm -hmm. but it all ultimately astronism views these earlier movements of, as having kind of failed, really, in their, okay. their attempt to kind of um, establish themselves for various different reasons. They were persecuted, for example. They may have. They may not have. Um, establish themselves you know strongly enough or, or distinguish themselves enough from existing religions so astronism does kind of see itself as that it that it's going to you know um achieve what these earlier religions couldn't because perhaps we live in a better time now of more religious freedom for example or the circumstances in which astronism have emerged are different to these earlier movements. Um, so there is that element that, that astronism is going to do what these earlier religions couldn't. And I, but I have seen that in other, other religions as well. Other new religious movements sometimes have this idea that, you know, well, they couldn't do it in the past. They couldn't achieve salvation, for example, we're going we're going to to do that um i think there has to be that and that would be well, interesting. There has we to have be. A, there's a technical we have technical capabilities now to explore on on yeah, levels that we that never amazing. existed previously and and that's you know utterly fascinating yeah. um whether i mean these religions of the past and so forth i mean everything tends to have a beginning and an end it has a has a duration so the life of a tree a tree is is born it lives so many years we do the same thing uh 
cultures seem to go through the same thing. The culture develops and and then it finally ceases it for one reason or another. And uh, that's part of that's history. That's why we today are, are also as much as we're fascinated with outer space. We also try to find out our origins, uh, our movements, uh, what happened at certain times, how people reacted, um, what caused something to develop yeah. that hadn't existed before and so forth. And so um, it's all an exploration and journeying is a lot of, is a part of that. And that means journeying into outer space as well, because that's how we explore part of how we explore. Yeah. Um, the, I just mean, call it a failed spirituality of the past. Uh, is, I mean, is a tree a, a it's, it's, is a tree ultimately a failure when it dies? Uh, I suppose, in some sense, yes, but we don't tend to True. apply that term. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the kind of ego of astronism talking there, and I, and, and you can see that in mm. other religions. You know, you can yeah. see Christianity that 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 religions, and I'm talking, I'm kind of anthropomorphizing them now. I'm talking to them yeah. as as kind of people but um you know they do have egos you know the, the christian church thinks that it can save the whole the whole species you know that it can yeah. save all of humanity uh islam says the same uh buddhism says the same even even so so yeah. in, in a way religions have to be very in a way egotistical that they can do what they what humans need them for in a sense uh, otherwise, how? Why would you follow it? You know, why would you follow that religion if it's kind of half-hearted? You know, well, we, you know, we might be able to give you what you're looking for, but we might not. You know, um, I'm not saying all religions are like that, but certainly there is an aspect of astronism that is very much about that. Oh, right. there's an aspect of paganism that's very much that too. We, we yeah. feel that if we know how one should live and yes. and at least we can be the models yes for other people in in how in our responsibility for the environment yes and so yes and then that's that's an ego thing it's it's not when the pagan is very resistant to trying to convert other peoples so we're not on some kind of a missionizing even um, evangelism drive as as you have with christianity for instance but and so in that sense it's probably more like judaism it doesn't seem to be really a, a missionizing faith um yeah but yeah ego i mean <laughs> i don't know where where you what you would have without ego ultimately i think it's again a universal there has to be some kind of assertion that that a religion is making some kind of claim um that it's going to solve some kind of problem you know astronism sees the problems of limitation sort of human limitation as being the cause of suffering and evil um christianity sees sin or sort of disobedience to god as as, a, as the cause of suffering and evil and that it has the, the tools to solve that problem the, solve that, problem, that, yeah. that, that relates back to earlier where we were talking about this kind of negative outlook in a way religions particularly that on this missionizing journey they have to present the world as um corrupt as um you know in a bad shape in a bad way to justify their existence you know if if the world if humanity was was doing great if we were saved already if we were um without suffering and evil then we wouldn't need christianity would we we wouldn't need um islam or these other more sort of missionizing uh, religions there has to be a problem and the problem has to be so grave it has to be so severe that it justifies this religion being founded you know and that that's how I've seen it anyway. Now well, that's, I mean, that's for every religion, but but even Buddhism, there's elements of that. You know, Buddha saw 
existence as suffering, didn't he? And he wanted yeah. to deviate that. And and a lot of the times, religious writings are a lot about describing the um, how bad things are, you know, to try and justify this is what we need to escape from or this is what we need to repair, you know? That's how I view it. All right, I would rephrase <laughs> it, or at least from a pagan perspective, and okay. say there don't have to be problems, but there are problems, right? And so, that's the reality. And and I think most religions, and especially paganism, at least, is responding to those problems. Yes, uh, I don't know if pagan. I think the pagan understanding would be that paganism is natural spirituality. Yes. And it, if you got rid of all the problems, you still would have that natural spirituality because it's communion with nature, communion with the cosmos, uh, com communion with with all manifestation. Yes. Um, whether those manifestations always have to be problematic, that's, that's a, another issue. And, and I think because there are problems, we have to deal with those problems. We can't just ignore them. And we deal with them within our particular spiritual frameworks. That's how we we tend to conceive of them and, and approach them. But um, I think paganism would not say that it exists because we have to have a problem. It's really just facing the reality that there are problems. And, yes. And, yes. And wants to deal with that. Yeah. Do you would you say that the sort of just to kind of round off the conversation now, maybe we should have talked about this at the beginning. Um <laughs> so, so this this concept of this term pagan, mm -hmm. if we talk about it that it is telluric, um I think that's the first aspect of it. What would you say? just to cut for people sort of concluding this this conversation what are the other main strands do you think or aspects of pagan that that give it its identity um the, or that show that it possibly exists in other traditions the abrahamic the dharmic just because because when you were talking earlier about you know not all pagans believe in um sort of a, a pantheon of gods for example yeah. Mm -hmm. sometimes when we're too vague about what something is when something's too subjective too individualistic you can kind of sit back and think well what is it you know if if we're not definitive enough it could be anything and i think possibly that's one of the issues that's ongoing but i just wanted to get your final all right i mean pagan is often referred to as the big tent of pagan yes. Yes, and and so you have this big tent with many many different forms within it. Yes, um, if there is a cent, what to see what the central things would be nature. Yes, the honoring of nature, the veneration of nature, even whether nature was first or was something that some external entity created, but it's nature that becomes. Uh, the one of the most unifying aspects of paganism. Another would be freedom of the individual, that yeah. there's nobody that can tell the individual what you have to do, what you have to believe. It's it's up to the individual uh, to come to those uh, answers for himself, herself. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a, an ethical element within paganism which hasn't been that strongly articulated but it's basically respecting the other uh, letting the for oneself to be free the other has to be free as well so freedom is something that is supposed to exist in a form of liberty um, and so I would say maybe those three the self yes. choice, the self determination, but nature and uh, the ethical idea of honoring life, honoring the world, honoring each other, um, and and having overall respect. Yes. Uh, 
And I think some pagan expressions maybe fall short on some of that, but I think that's relatively the unifying factors factors behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's brilliant. And it's kind of just rounds off what we've just been talking about, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good sort of um, overall grasp of, of for, for people to then take away with them and kind of think about perhaps how they use the word pagan and, and, and understand that word. Um, uh, thank you for, for for joining me again, Michael. It's, it's been, as always, a pleasure talking to you and... Um, I'm sure there'll be there'll be interesting responses to to this conversation, and um, again, I'm sure we will continue <laughs> our conversation. Right, well, I just like to say I do enjoy our conversations. Yeah. I do enjoy our exchanges, and yeah. um, I like if you have feedback, I would love to hear some of it. But uh, I look forward to further ones in the in the future. Yeah, we will definitely. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. So. <laughs> thanks for joining me and um and for everyone who who's going to be watching this thanks for watching and i will see you again next time so okay. thanks everybody see bye you bye bye, <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs>